Welcome to Global Business, CCTV's new program with insights into Africa's ever-changing business landscape. From Nairobi to Johannesburg, from Lagos to Cairo, from small entrepreneurs to large-scale enterprises, we take you directly to the people making the headlines. I'm G2 Abraham here in the Kenyan capital of Nairobi, where it's 9 p.m., 2 p.m. in Washington, D.C., and 2 a.m. in Beijing. Wherever you're joining us from, welcome. South African Airlines maintains its West African schedule despite the Ebola scare. And banks are offering incentives to help fundraising for Egypt's new Suez Canal project. And finally, a controversial new application designed by a Nigerian firm enables women to calculate their value as a bride. We begin with the effects of the Ebola crisis on the African aviation industry. Yesterday, Kenya Airways announced that it would not stop flying to Ebola-hit countries in West Africa. Now, this is despite the medical charity Medicine Sans Frontier warning that the deadly virus is now spreading faster than it can be contained. Today, South African Airlines also maintained that it's in the same position. The epidemic has so far killed more than 1,000 people. CCTV's Guy Henderson now has our report from Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, South African Airways says that it's taking a similar approach on this issue. Both it and Kenya Airways say that they are acting in accordance with guidelines set out by the World Health Organization. One of the issues at play here seems to be that by stopping these commercial flights completely to these affected areas, well, that also stops those trying to help. So medical professionals and so on from getting into those areas. And of course, then that could also make this epidemic worse. Uh, now, the WHO does also uh, note that the risk of contracting Ebola on a commercial flight is fairly low uh, because uh, it is contracted by coming into direct contact with the bodily fluids of those who've been infected. Also worth noting, I think, that uh, the airlines that are flying there do have um, very strict screening processes. Anyone on an outbound flight will be screened uh, and tested before they leave. When they reach their destination, well, they won't be allowed to uh, get off the plane and go about their business until they've gone through another screening process. So there are those rigorous checks there, but nonetheless, uh, at a time when uh, health officials are warning that they do not at this stage have a handle uh, on this disease and it is spreading faster than they say they can contain it, there is this mounting pressure despite uh, those screening processes being in place for these, for these flights to be stopped completely. But it hasn't happened yet. Guy Henderson, CCTV, Johannesburg, South Africa. Moving to Zimbabwe, the country's struggling national carrier is set to resume international flights three years after its exit. Now, the transport minister recently said that the airline plans to service the China and London routes with help from a technical partner. Now, the news is sure to be a welcome boost to the tourism industry that's currently registering steady growth. CCTV's Farai Mwakachuya has the details. Air Zimbabwe's woes look like they could soon be a thing of the past. And it seems the national carrier picked the right time and right routes to bounce back with. There are currently four daily international flights from Harare to China. Thousands of Zimbabweans living in the UK makes London potentially lucrative too. Despite a history of unreliability, travel operators think the airline's direct flights can win back passengers. People want less flight time. <coughs> And people prefer not to go via some point. You want to check in and you know, I've checked in, I've settled in, the next thing I'm arriving. But can the airline, which is persistently needed to be bailed out by government, sustain the operations, especially with the state coffers dry? The only route forward for e Zimbabwe is to make sure that they go back to the air skies, it's also to make sure that they rebrand, uh, not necessarily with government support, but possibly we're expecting a case of partnership. We look at the Ethiopian Airways, Kenya Airways. These are airlines with strategic partnerships where an airline does not necessarily have to be government-owned for it to be an airline of an African nation. And even with its debt burden, the airline could still be attractive to potential suitors. 
sometimes investors don't necessarily look at the balance sheet and say you have to be asset free. Is the asset, even if it is a debt position like we are having in Zimbabwe, can the debt be international skies once again? Farai Mwakutuya, CCTV, Harare, Zimbabwe. Corporate governance is again under the spotlight. According to the Institute of Internal Auditors, Africa has a long way to go to improve its rates of good practice in the private sector. Now, the Institute released an index this week showing the levels of compliance in South Africa. Sumitra Naidu has more of the details. The Corporate Governance Index measures ethics, compliance, leadership, operational risk, internal audit, performance and external risks. And it seems only a handful of companies are implementing these practices. The index showed a decline from 3.2% last year to 2.9% this year, despite the severe impact of the financial crisis, which was as a result of poor governance structures, few are making changes. Since the financial crisis and you know the global economic downturn, I think there's been a recognition that what organisations need to do and need to be is much more sustainable and uh, they, they need to have longevity. Experts believe that an effective corporate governance strategy may be the difference between the success and failure of a company. South Africa follows the king codes of good practice for corporate governance. In recent years, there's been better compliance. But the codes don't allow for criminal prosecution for non-compliance, as opposed to some countries like in the United States. The King Codes were first introduced in South Africa back in 1994 and has become highly regarded around the world. But the Institute for Internal Auditors say while many companies in South Africa understand what needs to be done, many are still finding it difficult to embrace the principles of good governance. If you look at the spirit of governance, you know, we're talking about fairness, accountability, um, transparency, um, responsibility. Those are actually very deep philosophical um, concepts when you think about it. But when you have that ingrained in organizations, um, you find that the organization tends to be a lot more um, with the kind of corporate citizen that one would want to see. Micro lender African Bank last week had to be bailed out by the South African Reserve Bank. Many are now questioning the company's corporate governance structures. No financial sector regulatory regime can completely prevent failure of uh, financial institutions. Indeed, effective policy includes the resolution of financial firms in trouble and in a way that imposes lo losses on those investors who profited from that firm's activities and who were in a position to exercise influence over that firm's management. The role of internal auditors has become more important in recent years. They have now become more involved and responsible for helping to steer a company in the right direction. Where they're really, I suppose, to act as a conscience to the organisation, to actually, you know, sort of look at um, what organisation's doing, the risks that it's carrying, the controls that it's got, and be able to say, you know, actually, guys, you know, you could be doing things differently. This is an area where uh, things could go wrong and you need to address it. Elsewhere on the continent, there's still much work to be done to improve good practices. Most African countries have only recently adopted governance codes. Some use King 3 and others have their own codes. And while the corporate sector is often scrutinized, the public sector also has a role to play. We have too many people in leadership positions who are in it for self. It's about self-interest as opposed to um, in the end, working in the interests of the greater good. And that is exactly what we need on the continent right now. Surprisingly, the Good Governance Index showed the public sector performing slightly better than private companies, although both levels of compliance remains low. Sumitra Nadu, CCTV, Johannesburg. Entrepreneurs in Africa now have a chance to access up to $207 million for their innovative and profitable business ideas. Now, the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund awards traditional and repayable grants to private sector companies for their ideas in agriculture, agribusiness, renewable energy, adaptation to climate change, and access to information and financial services. The purpose of the program is to improve incomes of smallholder farmers and those impoverished in rural, rural areas. So far, 179 grantee businesses around the continent have been selected for funding through various competitions. Earlier in the week, we featured the Baringo Cummings Power Plant Generation that 
has just recently won a $1 million grant. Now to elaborate a little bit more on this for us, we're joined in studio by Anjali Sani, the advisor for renewable energy and adaptation to climate change technologies at the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund. She specifically is focused on East Africa. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, ACF awards grants to private sector companies for their innovative business ideas uh, that the, will help the lives of smallholder farmers or those uh, impoverished in the rural areas. Um, if you could briefly give us an example of another recent uh, grant winner and what it was about their company that really caught uh, AECF's uh, eye. Great, thanks. Um, well, I'll give you an example of a business model, and I'll name quite a few companies that are okay. trying out that model that across works. the region. So uh, Pay As You Go Solar is getting a lot of traction in the East African uh, community. Okay. Um, it's where um, rural people can afford solar home systems because they don't have to upfront the full cost of the solar system. Mm. What they can do is pay as you go in little bits and what, what they do is they, they just send mobile money, uh, M-Pesa, um, for the day's use or for the week's use for that system. Um, and the names of some companies are M-Copper, uh, Mobisol in Tanzania, Off-Grid Electric in, in Tanzania, Phoenix Technologies in Uganda, B-Box in Rwanda. Okay. They're all trying to pioneer this uh, innovative technology. And is there an initial cost for the technology? Yeah, what a customer would do is put down a small deposit, mm. pick up the system, take it home, okay. and then they would pay as you go. So it's fairly it. accessible to the average it's, person. It's fairly accessible. Okay, yes. and then AECF, AECF, pardon me, is funded by multilateral and bilateral donations. Uh, who are they and what are their incentives in funding this sort of program? Okay, in this case, for the, for the new round mm -hmm. of funding, for which there'll be $20 million funding availability, um, which means probably around 25 companies will be able to access that. It's the British government and the Swedish government wow. that have put money into it. Okay. okay. And for um, eligibility, mm -hmm. it must be the for-profit private sector. The projects must be implemented in the East African community, but aside from that, mm -hmm. the companies can be from anywhere around the world. Whether it's China, whether it's Mali, the companies can come from all Is there a size countries. requirement for the companies? Um, no, they just, um, the minimum amount a company can apply for is $250,000. Okay. And the maximum $1.5 million. Okay. And the company must be able to match that. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, your company has both traditional grants and repayable up to uh, $1.5 million. Uh, and can you maybe just elaborate a little bit more on, on who's eligible? I know you were just saying it was yeah. anywhere along the world. And it's company size-wise, is right. there, is no, it has to be a certain size? Uh, it doesn't have to be a certain size. I mean, from our past experience mm -hmm. and with uh, in, under the REACT window, okay. uh, which is this funding opportunity, we funded up to 32 companies to a level of $24 million. Now, 80% of those are startup. Mm. So it doesn't really matter. It's the strength of the innovation and, and the strength of the business idea and that real possibility to get to scale. Mm. That's what we're looking for. And in, for those wondering about your company's uh, governance structure, can you share with us a little bit about your working model? Sure. So because it's donor funds, mm. Um, this entity called the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund, the AECF, it's housed under what's called the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, okay. AGRA. And we as KPMG are fund managers for, for, for oh. this. Now, because it's donor money, we build in structures that ensure transparent decision making, mm. which includes an independent investment committee. And so whilst we manage the whole competition process okay. and we manage the companies for the six year period after they've won, okay. um, we have an independent committee that selects those companies. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining Great. us in studio. That's Anjil Sani joining us from Africa Enterprise Challenge. Thank you for taking time. Thank you very much. Of course. Okay. Let's look now at the markets that we track here for you to see how they're closing the day. Let's look specifically now at South Africa, where stocks fell for a third straight session after a slew of financial results knocked the prices of companies such as the lender Standard Bank and the mining firm Harmony Gold. Now, speaking of Harmony Gold, the company's experience is providing a stark warning to investors and metal traders who were banking on South Africa's platinum sector, making a swift recovery from the crippling five-month strike that ended in June.
And banks are offering incentives to fund raising for Egypt's new Suez Canal project. Africa is on the move. It's home to seven of the world's ten fastest growing economies. From small businesses to large-scale enterprises, you're directly from entrepreneurs behind the story. It's about putting you in the picture so you know where Africa fits in the global context. Global Business, weekdays at this time on CCTV Africa. African leaders have been urged to make it easier to move and do business across borders within the African continent. Africans should be free to move in their continent, to do business, to interact, if we are to grow the levels of investment and trade that will ensure that we are able to create the jobs for our people that we require. Welcome back. You're watching Global Business. Now, Egypt will fund the first phase of the new Suez Canal mega development project through investment bonds that will be accessible only to Egyptians. Now, the project, inaugurated last week, aims to widen the scope of services currently provided by the Suez Canal and will also include the establishment of new cities and industrial zones. CCTV's Yasser Hakim takes up the story for us. The Egyptian president called it the beginning of a new era. A new canal will be adjacent to the current one to receive triple the number of ships passing through and provide better services in the new sea ports. When ready after a year, analysts expect the revenue of the canal will leap from $5 billion to $13 billion annually. All this at a huge cost. The first phase alone, digging the canal, will cost $8.5 billion, money the government doesn't have. The president, therefore, turned to the people. I know Egyptians are sensitive about the ownership issues. To fund the canal, we will issue LE100 shares for Egyptians only, no foreigners. It will be built by Egyptians and owned by Egyptians alone. Students and Egyptians abroad can buy shares too. To the surprise of many, the Prime Minister announced on Thursday that five-year investment bonds will be issued to Egyptians rather than shares. The interest will be 12% annually. It's disappointing because many Egyptians were going to buy shares to fill their own piece of the canal for themselves and their children. Now it's just lending to the government, not more. So what are Shares and private ownership of a strategic asset like the Suez Canal is very risky. It will need new laws and strict regulations, but time is tight. So the government opted to go for investment bonds. Still, the president says he is sure Egyptians will cover the $8.5 billion needed to construct the new canal. He even offered free bonds to 1.5 million poor people. He wants it to be the country's new mega national project. Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. Yes, sir, Hakim now joins us live from Cairo. Yes, sir, this is the first major expansion to the Suez Canal in a 145-year history. Now, logistically speaking, how will the new setup increase efficiency? Right, the canal is a bit narrow, and that's why it will take, uh, let's say, uh, 10 hours for one ship to pass by and, and can get through to the other side. Uh, there will be a, a whole queue of ships that can wait for hours uh, and, and this way what they're saying you, the same 10 hours you can get four uh, ships to pass so first of all you are more than tripling the income that's coming in from ships that are paying to go through the Suez Canal each day second of all there will be services provided to the ships at this point what the Suez Canal is is just like a toll station on a high road where you pay a ticket and pass through now they want to offer uh, services such as uh, maintenance, repair, uh, docking uh, containers in and out of the, uh, the port. There will be a port there. Uh, so this will be extra services with extra income. Then there will also be a uh, tourism uh, uh, city there and also an industrial and free trade area where there will be uh, uh, factories opening up. So they will be using the port and the Suez Canal and there will be also yachts 
uh, uh, coming in to, to serve the touristic city from Europe, from the Mediterranean countries. So it will be a whole list of different services that will help uh, make this project more uh, comprehensive. Uh, between tourism and factories and, as you said, tripling the income, what are the estimates of annual revenue boost from this project? C currently, it's about $5 billion per year. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, uh, the experts are saying uh, that it could reach around 13 to 13.5 billion in a few years, but in, in around 10 years. But uh, at this point, uh, once the, the project is ready, the digging, which is the first phase, will end in one year from this month. Uh, and then uh, we'll go to the second phase to build the port and the uh, uh, free trade areas in two years. There is expectancy of about 10% uh, increase, 10 to 12% increase annually once the construction has ended. All right, thank you for that, yes, Yasser Hakim, joining us live from Cairo. Now let's take a look at commodities and how they're trading for the day. Specifically, let's look now at Brent crude, which edged up, helped by a weakening in the dollar. Crude has, however, remained near a 13-month low of $103 a barrel. This is as a shaky European economy fueled concerned about demand in a well-supplied oil market. And still coming up, a controversial new application designed by a Nigerian firm enables bride calculations. We tell you the details. Welcome back. You're watching Global Business. Now, a new app designed by a Nigerian firm enables women to calculate their value as brides. Now, users of the application consider criteria such as beauty and education in assessing a bride's worth. But the creators of the application, who say it's meant to be humorous, have been criticized for taking lightly a deeply rooted cultural practice that objectifies women. Susan Mongeli reports for our grassroots segment. This is Lola Ogunbadero's big day. Lola's female relatives are helping put finishing touches to her traditional Yoruba wedding dress. They add a necklace and finally a head wrap to match, a required accessory for brides from southwest Nigeria. Insurance we cover. Many people in Nigeria still follow their traditional customs when it comes to big ceremonies like weddings. But they also blend the old with the new. An important cultural practice that has been passed down from generation to generation is the exchange of dowry between two families. Ahead of her wedding, Lola tried to use a new app that calculates your worth as a bride. I tried doing it once and I felt this is not how it's calculated. Because obviously when they sent their, when they asked for my own list, we didn't put all those, we went to school into consideration, or it's just a traditional thing. Well, what they have been doing since right from time, bring all the yam or the, but I just feel the bride app is just a game. It's just a play, play thing. Lola may not have given the bride price app a positive review, but it generated over 4 million hits from 56 countries when it was first launched three months ago. The app was created here at Anakle, a digital agency located in a suburb in Lagos, Nigeria's bustling commercial capital. Users answer a series of questions ranging from skin color, height and weight to leg shape. The app also includes other criteria such as education and country of residence. Ofure Okpebor, lead developer at Anakle, explains just how the app works anyone to check a bright price for their friends their enemies or themselves and um, there are a lot of categories to choose from the application decides based on be, decides based on physical appearance cooking skills um, educational levels and all of those 
The Bride Price app has, however, courted controversy since its inception. For the category of skin color, popular Kenyan actress Lupita Nyong'o's complexion is valued at 303 US dollars, while white tenacious, referring to users who use bleaching creams, are deducted a similar amount. It's an inside joke by Africans for Africans, right? And we, the concept of bright price does not mean sell. Back at Lola's wedding, the groom and his friends are participating in another age-old tradition. They are lying prostrate before their elders in a symbolic act of humility to ask for their blessings. According to gender activist Jiwan Okorodudu, the Bride Price app and traditional practices like dowry marginalize and objectify women. I think I will advise young girls to say no, we don't want to be sold, and then uh, if they actually love each other, they can arrange, you know, and talk to the parents and see how this whole bright price thing should, uh, you know, it, we need to stop it, really. And then the, the advice to parents is that uh, you're not selling your child. But for the young couple who just got married, the elders have indeed spoken. Leaving the debate behind for now, it's clear that for them, it's the sentiment of togetherness and joy that their marriage symbolizes that's important a time when family and friends come together to sing, dance and feast. Susan Mongeli, CCTV. Reinforcing to young girls that they should not be sold. All right, let's look at Forex's now. Uh, looking at how your money is trading, specifically looking now at Nigeria, the country sold $100 billion Naira, or about 670 million worth of the bond, with maturities ranging between 3 and 20% at auction earlier this week. Sales fetched higher yields than expected. All right, that's it for this edition of Global Business. Remember, you can send us your feedback to globalbusinessafrica at cctv.com. You can visit our Facebook page, CCTV Africa. You can stay in touch with Global Business on Twitter using the handle at CCTV News Africa. I'm G2 Abraham. Thanks for watching.